thank you, Aubrey, for an opportunity to present uh, efforts that we have started in a very, very small country that most of you probably uh, haven't visited yet. I hope to get you excited not only about the country I come from, even though I have spent my last 23 years in the United States, um, most recently at Worcester Polytech Institute. Uh, the idea to create an international center for aging research came from the president of the, of the University of, um, of uh, Nova Gorica, very tiny little sign, who's a physicist, a world-renowned physicist, knows nothing about biology, uh, cornered me at the meeting and said, it would be so cool if my university would have a center, international center for aging research. And, um, of all people, he decided that I was probably the person to do it, even though I wasn't even involved in aging research. Even though after today, I think we're all involved in aging research, people in this room and people everywhere else, because aging is the largest risk factor in biomedical sciences. So Slovenia is a very tiny country. It compares, it compares to the size um, of New Jersey. It's got two million people. Uh, and what's, uh, for me, most exciting about the initiative I would like to present to you is that it really lies in the region uh, up at the northern tip of Adriatic Sea, which is part of Mediterranean, and a location that is, uh, that is traditionally been observed for the benefits of Mediterranean diet, for the way of life, uh, many, many, many things that traditionally in biomedical sciences we don't pay attention to. And very conveniently, uh, Slovenia is also part of the European Union, allowing us access to significant funding that um, European uh, Union has decided, especially in the next six years, 2014 to 2020, through Horizon 2020 to uh, spend on uh, active and healthy aging. This is a really a, a compilation of a few shots of Slovenia, if you've never been there. Uh, even though it's a tiny country, geographically we cover everything from, uh, from the sea to the Alps, uh, we have caves, we have uh, uh, rivers, we, we have one of the most picturesque uh, settings probably in, um, uh, in the world. But what I'm going to focus today and the reason that we decided to locate the center uh, of the region that I'll introduce to you shortly is, is really the centuries, uh, centuries old tradition in winemaking. Winemaking, aging, you know, there's, there's a lot of parallels, and even if we're not successful with anti-aging using wine, I think we'll all be happier a little bit. Uh, uh, Vipava is a very small town. Nova Gorica is here. The main university campus is here. Uh, however, we decided to start this uh, initiative in Vipava, which lies in the valley, like I said, that has for centuries been known for wine production. It's uh, geographically very close to uh, the border that doesn't exist anymore with Italy, uh, the region where there's a number of centers and research institutes and a lot of international uh, research centers that we collaborate with. And in so many ways, the region Friuli, uh, Venezia, Giulia really unites uh, the region of uh, Slovenia and Italy. So communication, scientific communication along this border is a lot faster and a lot more efficient sometimes than with the capital city of uh, Ljubljana. Uh, like I said, Vipava Valley, uh, so start the center uh, for aging research. Well, what do I hang it on? The university is physics heavy, environmental sciences heavy, nanomaterials uh, excellence, uh, but no life sciences. So I, I had to find, I had to find a, way, a way how to really root this effort into something that was real, and the only thing I had going for me was really this uh, centuries-old tradition of what the valley offered itself. And besides wine and olives uh, uh, and the fruit, uh, fruit production, there wasn't really much there, even though, uh, uh, you know, those traditionally belonged to agricultural industry, I figured out I might as well use them as a very strong backing of the initiative that I'm trying to start. Uh, this is the Lentieri complex. So trying to find a place where we're going to do it would be easy if you could build it from scratch. But again, we took advantage of century-old, not only traditions, but centuries-old architecture and places 
that were in severe need of renovation are being abandoned across Central Europe because they're very difficult and very expensive to maintain. However, it become available and through European, European funding and funds for uh, regional, uh, regional support in Europe, we were able to acquire significant funding to renovate a 17th century palace that now houses not only, so this is the first building that has been renovated, it houses Center for Wine Research and the Center for Biomedical Sciences of the University. Mm -hmm. This is the next wing that we are starting to renovate again with European funding uh, this November. And these are going to be the future residential facilities for students, faculty, visiting scientists, and everybody else who's going to be visiting us. The Palace Lanteri sits at the very, uh, at the very beginning of a river with the same name as the town, which is Vipava. It is the only river in Europe that actually starts the delta out of a mountain, which is right here. There are six springs that feed into these tiny <coughs> two uh, wings that flow through the entire complex. The complex has about 9,000 square meters or 90,000 square feet of, uh, of space that we're going to be uh, using for our efforts. This is from the back side, the way the newly renovated building uh, looks. This is one of the rivers. This is my office. If anybody wants to visit, so you know where to find me. They have done a beautiful job. And <coughs> being a 400-year-old building, it had to undergo re renovation without jeopardizing any of the historical content. And so that was quite a feat. And so if I briefly take you through the inside, where you can only imagine having biosafety hoods, incubators, gas tanks, and everything else that essentially pollutes this beautiful space. But it gives you a completely different inspiration to, to work, to think. Uh, there's nothing sterile about this. Uh, there, there is so much history, so much tradition. There's so many memories in these walls over 400 years. And I think everybody that we have brought uh, through these places has been inspired. and astounded and very productive because if you choose to take one of the student desks and try to do some work in one of the lectures, you quickly discover that if you just open the window and listen to the river flowing by you while you're working, um, actually products of some work can be quite, quite inspiring. Uh, this is the main hall, um, the main part of this picture. This is a door, a main door into the building. That's about this thick. I have the key to it in my bag. Um, it, it, it's real, and it offers so much promise uh, that I, I will never part with that key. So one of the historic restorations really focused on refinishing. These are 400-year-old ceiling beams that have been hand-painted, taken down one at a time, refinished, and replaced. So just, just being in this building, I think, has done something, something for me to inspire me in so many ways to say, yes, this would be a really good home for what we want to do. So what do we want to do? Uh, we have heard everything covered today. What is important in the process of, of um, alleviating the effects of aging uh, in general? And we decided that we really uh, need to focus on four, um, uh, on, on four main objectives that are not only biomedicine-based. I think we need to do a lot more as a community and in the center to enable this comprehensive shift in thinking how we address aging medicine. Uh, Obviously, our final goal is healthy aging, is the improvement of quality of aging process. We have heard plenty about that. We would like to do that through, obviously, basic research and applied research. We'd like uh, to involve quite a bit of uh, biomedical industry clinicians uh, uh, and uh, uh, medical device industry into the process. Obviously, provide continuous education opportunities through workshops and so on. And, and maybe uh, a piece that we don't talk enough about, uh, which is where you know, nutritional rehabilitation, changing the way of life, uh, helping people create or, or reset their bodies to where biomedical discoveries can really make a difference if we offer them as therapy. So putting a therapy into a body that is more willing is going to have a better effect than putting it into a body that is falling apart mentally and physically. So anything that we can do to reset really the whole, the whole body, I think, is, is just as important as any science that we can do. 
So we focus based on the expertise that we have uh, in the center really on four different strategies, how to go about it. This is quite traditional stem cell derived or non-stem cell derived cell transplantation strategies for a number of conditions. I think this is a really important one that we don't, uh, as a society, spend enough time thinking about, is stimulating endogenous regeneration. Regeneration as a process occurs, we have heard that especially in some organs spectacularly, such as liver, but I think there is an innate memory of the cells to respond to injury with either more pro-regenerative response uh, versus scar-forming non-functional response. So we are spending quite a bit of time uh, demonstrating that that actually would be one way uh, to alleviate the problem. Uh, we are focusing quite a bit on pain, and we haven't really talked about that here much either. Chronic pain is really one of the parallels that goes with many, many conditions that happen with aging. We've got a strong uh, research group, this one developing drugs for pain intervention. Um, and, um, and maybe equally important, uh, in, instead of treating diseased cells, uh, finding a way to just take them out. Take them out. Don't target mitochondria separately. Don't target lysosome. Just take it out. Finding a way to mop what you take out is a whole other problem. Because if you destroy a whole bunch of senescent disease sick tissue, whatever's left over after you have done that job uh, might be just as bad as uh, leaving them there. Uh, we have assembled, uh, really, I think this is becoming a key. Uh, several of our speakers today uh, come from traditionally unrelated fields to biomedical sciences. We have mechanical engineers, biomaterial sciences, material scientists, electrical engineers, biochemists. I think that's really important. There is no uh, biological solution only anymore for any given problem. We do need engineers. We do need biochemists. We need electrical engineers uh, to, to test our function. So we have, in a very similar way, tried to assemble a group that really cross talks across a number of different fields. These are wine people. I like them a lot. They, they produce wine. The university makes its own wine. And Yuri Pishkur, who uh, leads the group, uh, has just sequenced the yeast uh, that's used for wine fermentation, identified every gene that contribu contributes to uh, polyphenol production, aromas, all sorts of things. And now we can try and manipulate yeast and ferment the grapes in a way that will produce wine with certain content of compounds that we re really want to have. For example, we heard resveratrol. Resveratrol used to be, uh, you know, used to be a, a joke. Well, we know that anti-aging compounds, antioxidants, ha can have really profound uh, protective effects. They may not have curative effects, but prevention and protection is just as important, so the damage doesn't occur as fast as it would otherwise. So we have a bunch of wine components being purified uh, and tested for the effects on slowing down the aging process. Uh, we have some new uh, platform technologies, uh, libraries of uh, single domain antibodies where we could selectively screen for cells based on their antigen presentation without the need to know what the antigens are, which is really nice. So if you flow, for example, senescent cells that you know are senescent over this platform, uh, you can identify hits of these antibodies that then when combined and applied in vivo will mop up or target whatever is senescent in your body. So there's some new platforms. We have a uh, nanomaterials lab that's working. This is our group that's dealing really with the biology and molecular mechanisms. And we have added two components that we think are, are important as well. One is computational modeling, and for now it's blood flow uh, through the brain through uh, after a uh, heart injury, uh, and computational predictors, uh, predictions for drug interactions. Translation, as I said, we think this is extremely important. Not only on the research side are we collaborating with a number of uh, local and not so local, this is in France institutes, but I think it's really important from the very beginning to involve the local businesses uh, that have an interest, uh, not necessarily in aging, but in biomedicine. So I think collectively calling everything biomedicine uh, gets us a lot better response than uh, trying to pigeonhole yourself into terminology that maybe is not quite, uh, quite effective. Education, we have just finished our, our first workshop, it's a week-long training course. We have more than 25 people from all over the world teach a practical course. 
in Taos Lanketti where you can maybe still see uh, the, the space. Uh, uh, it was a very successful one. So we really want to offer a location as well as a summer training place, not only for students, but for visiting scientists as well. Very similar to uh, the idea of Woods Hole. Uh, for those of you who have been to marine biological laboratories in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, you know that you can rent space for three months, bring your group, and do all your research in Woods Hole for a while. I think this um, would be a great, great opportunity for people to visit and do some, some great work together. Mm -hmm. And, and last but not least, as I said, is um, it's really uh, part of the care has to come from providing providing uh, advice uh, to to folks on nutritional rehabilitation. Coming from the United States, living in the United States, and those who uh, who are there with me, um, uh, we we all know how bad uh, this component of our life has become. Uh, there's rarely anything available anymore that has not been processed uh, to death. You can't buy a bag of chips that has only three ingredients, which is potato, salt, and, and oil. Uh, there's 25 ingredients. I don't know what they do, but they can be good. And so we have really, uh, we have departed so fundamentally from what we put into our bodies, and then we are surprised when everything goes haywire. Well, we shouldn't be. I think this is important. Uh, osteopathic therapy, uh, realigning our bodies. This, this is not magic anymore. In the United States, medical schools offer osteopathic, osteopathic medicine. It's essentially manipulative medicine that can align you before they cut you up, before they give you a whole bunch of pills and drugs. They can put you back together by realigning your joints, by manipulating <coughs> your body into a better, more physiological state. That has been known for centuries. We are just now starting to appreciate that as well. And at the same time, to really feed uh, uh, our better understanding of the regional importance for that to be happening in Vipala Valley, is really that we have, uh, we have areas within the region where uh, people 100 and older are not an exception. Uh, and we are doing a large epidemiological study and collecting samples, both on the level of, of genomics uh, to see if we can uh, detect what it is, but more important, monitoring uh, really indicators of their main thing, cognitive function. I think that is also critically important when we start talking about Alzheimer's and, and other, and other dementia-related uh, diseases. And so expected outcomes, obviously, uh, you know, a couple of really important ones. I think we need to be clinically relevant. I think we need to talk to physicians. I didn't talk about collaborative efforts that we have with local hospitals and clinics. Uh, I think this is really, really important. And, and I think uh, achieving sustainable quality of life is really the ultimate goal. And as we heard uh, before from, uh, from our speakers, pushing, pushing whatever is gonna happen, and I think it will happen. It may happen when we're 150 and that's relevant but pushing the time when the onset of a lot of these things uh, uh, can, be, uh, can be detected or can affect the population for as far as we can, I think should probably be one of the first, uh, first goal. Funding, who's funding us? Uh, there is no private funding uh, for now in this effort. This is really uh, investment of the Republic of Slovenia and a huge chunk from European Union to competitive programs is helping us establish uh, uh, not only continual renovation of the complex, uh, but also support, support some research. And we are very hopeful that with Horizon 2020 and one of the initiatives being supported is healthy and active aging uh, in the European Union, we hope uh, we will compete quite well. And that's all I have. Uh, this, is, this is really my project. I don't have a huge organization that is standing behind me. I have a handful of people that are helping me with this effort. Uh, I have a huge amount of optimism. Uh, I stole the key of the castle. I carry it with me wherever I go. It's my motivation. But I am so optimistic that with the concept that we have, uh, that we have developed, which is where sensor and tradition join science, for healthy and active aging is sure uh, to help us be successful and hopefully with, with some help from all of you. And that's it. Thank you.